Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. I was also going to echo uh, my thanks to all the co-sponsors, but people already have. So thank you all for being here and for helping to sponsor the event just by being here. Uh, my name is Ari Masevsky. I am involved with the Aravai Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, we're an environmental research institute down on the southern border of Jordan and Israel. So depending on how familiar people are with the region, we're about four hours south of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, about half an hour, 45 minutes north of Eilat, depending on who's driving. Um, and we're right on the southern border, about a kilometer from the border with Jordan in Israel. Um, we were founded in 1996 on the premise that the environmental issues in the region, which are serious issues, are issues that transcend the politics of the region. So regardless of whether you're Israeli, you're Palestinian, you're Jordanian, you're from South Africa, it doesn't matter. Environmental issues are real issues that the region is dealing with and that everybody has to come together on regardless of that. We've been around for 20 years and worked on research projects in Israel and Palestine and Jordan and all around the world um, with the core uh, focus of our research and our academics being that we bring people together from all around the region. So every semester, about a third of our students and interns come from Israel, Jewish-Israeli backgrounds. Um, a third of our students and interns come from Arab backgrounds in the region. So they come from the West Bank and Gaza. They come from Jordan. We've had students and interns from Egypt and Tunisia and Morocco, various Arab countries around the, around the region. Um, and a third of our students come from everywhere else around the world. Um, over the course of time that we have existed, we've had students from a couple dozen countries all around. Um, obviously, a good um, group of our students every semester come from the United States as well um, and get study abroad credit through Ben Gurion University for participating in our academic program. Um, so today we have two of our alumni here, not the ones up on the screen. Um, three of our alumni here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Eve Tendler came from Tel Aviv um, to share her story. Shadi Sheha came from Amman, um, where he grew up to share his story. And Jacqueline Best is from Denver and just got in this morning. So she's a little tired, but she's sharing with us as well. Um, so if you guys want to come up. Yeah. Hey. Pass the mic. OK. <laughs> so my name is Eve. I was born in Tel Aviv. Um, my parents. My father's family, they came from Hungary. They're Holocaust survivors who immigrated to Israel in the 70s. Um, my mom's family come from Germany. They immigrated to Israel at the 30s and Palestine. Um, and I grew up in a very, very Zionist environment. Uh, we used to travel a lot, hike, um, really on the concept that this land belongs to me and I have to protect it uh, later on in the army, but also environmentally. Um, and on the other side of the border. Um, <laughs> hey, my name is Shadi Shiha. I'm from, I am Jordanian Palestinian. Who knows what does it mean, Jordanian Palestinian here? Yes? You know it? You can't say it? <laughs> okay, Jordanian Palestinian means a Palestinian refugee lives in Jordan. Well, basically, my father is from Beersheba, my mom is from Jerusalem. Uh, after the 48 war, uh, my father displaced from his homeland to Kuwait. And after the 67 war, my mom displaced from Jerusalem after uh, the armed forces, uh, the Israeli armed forces, took over their, ha their house. Um, and then in 1991, they displaced again from Kuwait to Jordan after the Gulf War, if someone knows it. Uh, yeah. And I finished my degree in Amman in 2015 in autonomous engineering. It's about the hybrid cars and maintenance. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so growing up as a Jewish Israeli in the early 2000s means um, that I was very influenced by the disappointment of my parents from the Oslo Agreement negotiations of the 90s. Um, there's the second intifada going on, uh, which literally in Tifada means uprising. Yeah, uprising and uh, okay. resistance and fighting for the land. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't know that then, <laughs> but I did know that uh, there are people that want to kill me, and I knew that they are willing um, to kill themselves for that, and there were suicide bombers and stabbing attacks uh, in my street, in my, my hometown, Tel Aviv. 
Um, and no one really tells you what's going on. Like, I knew that they're Muslim. I knew they're Arabs. I didn't know who they are, why they want to kill me. I know that they scream Allah Akbar, which I didn't know what it means then. But for me, as an instinct, it means going under the table and hide. Um, and literally, it means Baruch Hashem, or God is great. But I didn't know that back then. Um, and um, it's frustrating because you are living in a scary environment that you don't understand. Um, and I think a changing moment for me was um, there was a war in Gaza, 2008, and um, I'm seeing on the television, I was like 14, I'm seeing on the television the city of Gaza being um, bomb bombed by the Israeli planes. And uh, at this, that point, things doesn't make so much sense anymore, so I start asking myself uh, questions about the reality where I live in. Uh, for me, I grew up in the UN, schools in Jordan. Uh, basically, it's 99% of the students are Palestinian refugees. And uh, like just mentioning the word Israel, it's a crime in Jordan. Uh, people call you traitor or normalizer. Normalizer means that you're acknowledging the existence of Israel and you denying the existence of Palestine. So for me, it was hard to accept the fact that uh, there's Israelis or Jews, so I grew up and everyone was teaching me that they are your enemies, they're going to kill you, they're going to eat you, I don't know why. Uh, until the moment that I got to know the Arab Institute, then I traveled across the borders. It was the first time I'm dealing with Israelis or Jews, like individually. Um, actually, how, was, uh, how was your family with the uh, well, it took me five months or four months to convince my family that I want to go to Israel to study. But uh, it was all rejection, all rejection. And I tried before to be in Israel or Palestine, or I called the Holy Land, like not to fight. <laughs> um, yeah, I tried too many times to visit my homeland, my home country, but uh, I couldn't. But through the Arab Institute, I had the chance to be there. And yeah, now I'm going to share with you some of my experiences there. With some, it was the first time I met Israelis. So I had this crazy guy with me. His name is Adam Shemus. He's from Mitula. Um, and he asked me this question like, uh, What are you doing here? I was like, uh, I'm here to study and I want to visit Laksa Mosque. And he was like, mm, Laksa Mosque? You mean the temple? I was like, No, it's a Laksa Mosque. So the second day, he brought a car and he drove me up north like four hours just to pray in al Aqsa Mosque. And that was a life, ex like life changing experience for me because like an Israeli guy took me to the Aqsa Mosque. Um, yeah, and then I met Eve who I didn't like, who wasn't like that tight because she told me I'm from Tel Aviv. I was like, oh, you're my enemy, so I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I think for me, uh, once I started understanding a little bit more, I learned for the first time the word occupation. I learned for the first time what Nakba means, which is the way I relate to the independence um, day. They call it Nakba, which means disaster. Yeah, Nakba means disaster. Um, and uh, I start um, going to these coexistence groups. Later on, I was facilitating some of them. But at the bottom line, when I was talking to people on the street about peace or um, the future, which can be maybe brighter than it is, uh, people are either very skeptic or they call, uh, they call you a traitor, very similar to my, uh, what Shadi experienced. Because if, I, if I'm a Jewish person living in Israel and I don't support everything that Israel does, people see it as problematic. Um, and I got frustrated. Um, and later on, I, after uh, doing the compulsory army service, I went traveling and I saw severe environmental degradation in Asia. I think in, sometimes in developing countries, it's more visible than it is um, than when, uh, where I came from. And I, when I hear about the Arva Institute, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is, this is an opportunity to talk about the conflict which uh, hits it from a different angle and from the common and what we share, which is, I think after one year together at the Arava Institute, we really understand that if we share something in common, Israel is Palestinian, um, is a really great love to the land that we feel like we belong to. Um, yeah. And 
after spending two semesters in the institute, um, I took a course called uh, Water Management yeah, water management Resources. And it was the first time actually I'm realizing that in Jordan we have a serious, serious water problem, or water issues. Um, basically, Jordan is one of the poorest country in water. So here's the map of Jordan, if you don't know it. It's not Michael Jordan, it's Jordan, the country. Yeah. So as you can see here, we're sharing the borders with Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, and Palestine, and Israel, and the Holy Land. Yeah. And uh, the main sources of water in Jordan, it's the groundwater and the surface water. So there's ma three main aquifers, the DC aquifer, we're sharing it with Saudi Arabia, and al Azraq aquifer, <coughs> yeah, and the Yarmouk River. Um, basically, there's a, through the peace treaty, peace, sorry? Peace treaty, yeah. Yeah, peace treaty uh, with Israel that uh, the treaty uh, says that we're going to take uh, to buy. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Be more comfortable. Okay. So we take 50 MCM per year. We buy it from Israel, and uh, the other sources, as I mentioned before, is the DC aquifer with Saudi Arabia and the Azraq and the Yarmouk River. So, uh, and people in Jordan, they um, they have like lack of education about water. So um, through my study, I try to relate my studies in autotronics engineering. It's about the hybrid cars. So I related it, I related it with my studies in the institute um, in like environmental way. So me and two of my friends, uh, we started project, a project called, uh, it's a waterless car washing. It's a waterless car washing. We use some like uh, material. It's a foam and a wax. So we wipe the car with it, and the car will be shiny and bling bling for three days. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and uh, we did some statistics. Uh, every car we wash it, it consumes 300 liters of water. That's too much. For so we did the study on a whole neighborhood. It has like 50 cars. And uh, at the end, we discovered that if we apply this for one hood, that we're going to save 1.7 million cubic meters per year. So, yeah, uh, we plan to start uh, hopefully in uh, the next six months to see how it's going. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think what's really cool about the Irvine Institute is like people are really related to the field which, which they came from. And um, when you live, we live the, together, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanian, Palestinians, um, and international students. And every week we have a session called Peace Leadership Seminar, where we sit together for th uh, three hours, and we just have to talk about all the things that maybe we don't want to talk about. Um, and sometimes people fight because not everybody agrees with each other, not necessarily Israeli with an Israeli or Palestinian with a Palestinian or in Israel with a Palestinian, and um, after it, we, we have to go back and, and live in the same dorms and take responsibility for what we've said. Um, one of our coolest um, opportunities is that you get to travel on vacations with your friends. So I got to visit Shadi's house in Amman, and um, apart from eating great shawarma all day, we also visited his house, and I'm walking in the house, and the first thing I see is a huge map of Palestine, <laughs> from floor to ceiling. And I'm like, whoa, maybe maybe I should get out. Maybe it's not the right place. But five minutes later, I'm sitting there with his mother, and she's telling me her story. And um, we are talking. And this is something that um, doesn't happen. I think not only in Israel-Palestine. People are scared to talk with people which they might disagree with. And uh, this is something that, like for many Palestinians, it's a, it's a, they make great sacrifices or, or Jordanians to come to Israel because they're, they might be called a normalizer, um, uh, but they do it anyway, which is which is incredible. Yeah, and uh, actually for me, when my friends knew that I'm studying in Israel, I lose four of them. They called me a uh, traitor. So yeah, and uh, the cool thing about this pill station that you talk freely and in really safe environment, 
and you have the freedom to fight after that. And you maybe have one beer or two beers, two beers with your friends. So, <laughs> yeah, you like the beer, huh? <laughs> um, you want to tell about that trip to Bethlehem? Yeah, so for me, after spending like one semester in the institute and traveling around with the friends, um, I had the chance to visit Bethlehem, the refugee camp. Uh, that was a really shocking moment because it was the first time I see the separation wall. Um, and I was thinking to myself that we should change this somehow, some way. Um, and I met this 12 years old kid. His name is Ahmad. And he showed me his belly, and it was like two bullets in it. And in his, a scar in his head, it has, I asked him, like, what is this? He told me it's a rubber bullet when I was eight years old. So we had, like, it was a, a huge group, uh, included Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians. So everyone at that moment decided to make a change somehow uh, and to share, to spread the word about what we're sharing in the, in the Arava Institute. Actually, um, that moment when I saw this, uh, I felt more responsible because it's not only my conflict, or someone else conflict. Actually, we had two American friends, um, Alex and uh, Lewis, and they were really shocked because no one know about this reality. So what, what I, why I acknowledge the Arava Institute because it's opened the eyes about this conflict because at the end of the day, we are all human. It's not only about Palestinian or Israel. It's not my conflict, no. Yeah. Um, another cool thing that the Institute does is if you look at the map, you can see that water doesn't know where the border passes. They just go everywhere. And um, one of a really cool projects that happens is that there is a stream that goes from the West Bank from the south, from Hebron. It goes through the Negev, through Bedouin communities, through the city of Beersheba, into Gaza Strip, and into the Mediterranean Sea. And this stream is being uh, polluted because of lack of infrastructure in many of these towns. Um, and the only way that we can even talk about this stream is if we talk to all the authorities which are involved. Um, so this is something really cool that I hope to get involved with. I'm actually moving uh, to study in Beersheba next year, where Shadi is originally from. And um, I think if you look about uh, at, at the region and probably all around the world, when you have uh, environmental issues and you have a conflict, um, they will always go together because the environmental issues will always exist as long as there is the conflict and political situation. And the political situation will never be solved as long as there is environmental injustice. And what we try to do in the Institute is talk about both of them at the same time and try to engage both narrative um, when we talk about the environmental issues of the region. And it can bring some hope, maybe, hopefully. Yeah. I'm like third wheeling this because this is really their show, but I just uh, showed up um, this morning at the airport when Ari picked me up, so I'm here to talk about my experience as well a little bit. Um, uh, I came from a very different narrative. Um, grew up in a Jewish with a Jewish American um, background and narrative and history, and wasn't really taught a lot. I had some knowledge of Israel and the West Bank and um, I went on birthright, I did the whole thing. I said, I think I need to come back here. Um, I also studied environmental science uh, for my undergrad and I said, okay, I want to do something with that. So I found this little institute in the middle of the desert and uh, it, the so what I did um, internship-wise, I was working on a lot of what Eve and Shadi was talking about with the water issues, um, working primarily with transboundary water management. A lot of what I was doing was wastewater management, um, a lot within the West Bank. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of West Bank Palestinians are not um, connected to a wastewater grid. No, sorry, 30% of them are connected to a wastewater grid. So that means the 70, 60 to 70% are, all of their wastewater 
black water, gray water either ends up in unlined cesspits or that wastewater goes into the groundwater or streams, and a lot of these streams run into Israel. Um, when they go into Israel, Israel's like, all right, well, you guys, the Palestinians, you guys polluted this water, so you guys have to pay to clean it up. And they do that. But the reasons why there are so few uh, Palestinians in the West Bank that are not connected to this wastewater grid is a little bit politically complicated. So what the Institute does is they are like, okay, well, we can't solve these big political problems. And maybe we can look at it from like a grassroots individual level and see what we can do, see how we can talk with um, some wastewater engineers in Israel and in Palestine and in Jordan, see what we can do. So we built some gray water systems while we were there, or while I was there. They're still doing that. Um, I was involved in a solar groundwater pumping project. Um, what else did I do? A lot of cool stuff. If you're at all interested in water issues, transboundary water issues between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, feel free to talk to me later. Um, but really the most influential part of the program for me was the peace building aspect of it, which is what they talked about um, a lot more, and just learning about these issues through um, my Israeli and Palestinian and Jordanian friends' eyes, because I really had almost no knowledge of the occupation of the conflict and being able to go to Jerusalem and see see the separation wall and then going to a refugee camp and seeing rubber bullets um, in little, like, uh, sorry, I just got off the plane, so I'm like, my word recall is really bad right now. Seeing rubber bullets on soccer fields that kids are playing on um, really helped me to understand the situation from as many sides as I could. And so when I came back, and even while I was there, I was like, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to, how can I share my experience with my American Jewish community? Because that, you know, that narrative is so strong, and I'm sure many of the, many people in here perhaps, you know, haven't, aren't, haven't had this opportunity and there's so much we can learn through our friends' eyes that is more real than what we see on, on the news and on Facebook and through our various filters that we put ourselves through. So I feel extremely lucky to have um, gone through this experience, to have met people like Eve and Shadi and um, it's why I, one of the main reasons I came back here, and um, I keep in touch with all my friends there, and um, just completely changed how I see the issues there. It changed my career path. Um, yeah, and I'm going to open up for questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, we can open up for questions. Um, we can also. Yeah, why don't we open up for questions? Does that work? Any questions? That's a good point. Who's the question person? How much of a problem in the area is environmental uh, pollution resulting from agriculture? Um, I can try and answer. Um, I think we probably, both of us, we don't, maybe you know, um, the accurate numbers. I do know that, for example, the Jordan River, uh, which used to be the main water source of the Dead Sea, um, now most of the water flowing there is agriculture. Um, Nitrates and phosphates. Yes, flowing from agriculture in the area, um, exactly where people go and, and do the, how do you call it, the baptism, yeah, it's actually mostly agriculture flow, um, so this is a very polluted area from agriculture, um, you know, fish farms also, um, you know. 
Um, I, I can also talk a little bit. Gaza, I don't know if you know the water situation there is extremely dire. Um, as of now, at 99 to 100% of um, their water is completely contaminated. A lot of that is due to um, agriculture and um, fertilizers and stuff getting into the groundwater as well as seawater intrusion. Um, Given that you've you've mentioned agriculture, can you talk to me about desert smart agriculture or pollution avoidance smart agriculture that you might have done at the institute? Yeah, we have a really cool sustainable agriculture research center. Uh, specifically, both of us were less involved in that. Um, you may <laughs> you might have heard um, our professor has found the only professor that managed to um, to grow. Uh, yeah, to sprout from uh, old seeds found in, in Masada. So we have uh, 2,000 year old date seeds found in the ruins of Masada. Oh, yeah, we have them in Ktora. <laughs> and, their, and their sons and daughters. So that's pretty cool. Um, and she also does a bunch of desert agriculture experiences trying to Right now, most of the uh, agriculture desert economy in Israel is dates, and she's trying to find a different, make it more varied, um, other replacements, um, so we'll be less dependent on monoculture of dates. So that's. Um, I, oh. uh, kind of related to that question. Um, have you guys been looking at how climate change will affect agriculture in this region specifically? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so climate change is only going to make the Middle East drier than it already is now. So um, the Institute is very aware of this. Um, the last two years, and you guys know probably a little more because you were there when it, this was happening, but they started this um, thing called Track 2, where they were like, all right, the governments of these three or four plus countries are not going to, um, are not doing a lot to figure out these environmental, uh, transboundary environmental problems, and they're only going to get worse because of climate change. So we brought together to the kibbutz. Um, members of parliament, um, engineers on both sides, climate scientists to talk about, and they've been working for like two plus years, or no, a year and a half maybe, I don't know, um, talking, about, talking about these water issues, talking about climate change, um, because as long as these political issues are going on, um, we're worried that the environmental issues are also going to be overlooked. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned a couple, or one water management policy, which is the, or not policy, but experiment, which is the waterless car wash. Talk about some more policy experiments that you did or that are ongoing currently through the institute. Oh, like you, you mentioned, the waterless car washes is something um, you tried to do to reduce the water use in that area. Could you talk about some more experiments that you did or studies being conducted by the institute about that? So I'm back here. Um, so I can start off and then obviously turn to these guys. So a lot of the research going on at the Arva Institute right now is focused on these water issues, um, the transboundary water issues. Um, so taking, for example, Jacqueline, were you involved in UJA? Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a, a, a Palestinian town uh, a little bit west of Jericho um, called UJA, um, where we've been involved for a number of years with the USAID grant um, to essentially develop and install localized gray water treatment plants um, in the local village. Um, so as Jacqueline was talking about, um, access to the water grid is obviously an issue throughout the West Bank. Um, and this is a town that doesn't have the access to the water grid um, and wastewater treatment that it would like. 
Um, so basically what we do is we work with the local village um, to develop and install um, localized gray water treatment plants about the size of this table um, that will treat the water for the, for the neighborhood so that they can be self-sufficient and don't have to rely on the water grid. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. The, the treatment plants, the wastewater treatment um, systems that we built were kind of pilot systems. So we're trying to say, all right, 80% um, of household water, wastewater is gray water. So anything that doesn't come out of your toilets um, as well as your uh, kitchen sinks. And so that water can be cleaned enough um, using these really basic um, filtration systems using bacteria and gravel, um, things like that, and it cleans it enough so that it can irrigate some plants like dates that can take in um, water that's not the cleanest, basically. Um, another project we did, like, like I said, the uh, solar groundwater pump, um, that was a really big one because there's a lot of date farms in this town, uh, Uja, that Ari was mentioning. Um, they also built a similar um, solar groundwater pump in Jordan. Um, were you working on that one? The solar groundwater pump? Okay, so basically between the period of time uh, 1986 and 1999, okay, the Jordanian government installed 18 sites. 18 watt PV water pumping system. PV, it's a photovoltaic water pumping system. It depends on the radiation of the sun, so it will uh, generate electricity, so it will pump the water from the ground to above. But uh, now, um, this water pumping uh, site, uh, one only working, it's called the uh, Well of Retire, Bir Mutqa'idin, located in Al Azraq uh, city. Um, and, uh, and why this uh, uh, was uh, it founded uh, just to uh, provide water for the Bedouin families and their herds uh, because they know they're doing grazing and so they need water to wash, to drink, to whatever. But uh, and this water is not drinkable because it's a bit salty. So um, and you know by, by time, like year after year. Uh, the Bedouin people need change. So now they need the uh, electricity, grocery, markets, schools for their kids. So they left their, uh, this uh, site, so it's broke down because there, there wasn't any follow-up or maintenance from the um, JWI, it's the Jordanian Water Authority. Yeah, and uh, back to your question about the waterless car washing. Um, this, uh, now we're using something called poly polymer, polymer, polymer uh, science. It's basically this material, it's uh, waxy material and more plastic. So it consumes water, but like to uh, produce, let's say, uh, two gallons of it, we need just like two uh, small cups of water. So that's why we don't stay well with this project. And uh, this experiment is still on uh, under testing because it's quite expensive to produce these materials. Now we're looking for some uh, some similar material, but it's going to be a bit cheaper than water, so it will encourage people to use it. Yeah. Regarding the Bedouin communities, also in the Negev in Israel, we have um, about 200,000 Bedouins living in the Negev. Uh, Seventy thousand of them are living in unrecognized villages and um, uh, the research I was doing was talking about agricultural perceptions in the Negev. It was more of a social study. Um, what we try to look at is how through um, talking about more traditional agriculture and grazing with the Bedouins we can um, renew or remanifest their connection to their land which after years which have they have been displaced again and again. Um, uh, yeah, so we are also, I think the Arvine Institute many times we try to combine um, not only hard science, um, but only how the society meets these cool inventions or how, how do they accept it and how can we make it 
uh, more appropriate to the community or the society which we are trying to uh, provide this, this uh, technology to, uh, which I find really uh, important. Uh, years ago, when I was working for the USGS, I understood that the aquifers were really important in, for all those nations and that they shared the same underground water sources. And I've always been fascinated to learn more about how that actually works because it's rarely something you see in the news, but they are all, well, it depends upon the country, sharing the same water. And the Bedouin would not have access to those groundwater. Right. And if you were doing the solar extraction, that would still be pretty close to the surface, right? Those wouldn't be getting down to the aquifer. I mean, well, about yes. I think the ones we had was about 50 meters um, down, 50 to 100 meters. So it was hitting um, some of those some of those aquifers. Yeah. So how many big aquifers are there? Um, can you mentioned put the map. Uh, yeah. So there, so there's one. Mm, okay. Wait. Can you do, go back to the Jordanian one? Yeah. Shadi, Shadi did a good. One. So there's one that Jordan and Saudi Arabia share. That's a um, the DC aquifer. Uh, that was found fairly recently, um, and they only recently also started pumping out of it. If you look at Google Maps images, you can see. Um, kind of like you know when you're flying over the, w the middle of the U.S. and you see those giant um, circles, like crop circles. You see that, but in the middle of Saudi Arabia desert, and so they're using a lot of that water really intensively. And this is not a, a an aquifer that's going to replenish itself. So there's a lot of talk about how they can use this water, this aquifer, more sustainably because I think that current estimates are what, like 50 years at the current um, rate of use. There's another, I think there's two aquifers in the northern part of the West Bank, and that's where a lot of the water that um, West Bank Palestinians use, and I think it does cross over into Israel. Can you think of the other one? So the, the north uh, western aquifer is a shared aquifer, so the water they get the, it gets renewed from the water that are um, in the West Bank Mountains. That's uh, where Jacqueline mentioned before, there is not a lot of wastewater infrastructure, so the aquifer is also getting polluted, uh, and Israel is also extracting water from there. Um, so that's where most of the water of the West Bank in Area A are coming, but actually in Area C and B, they're buying the water from Israel, so they're completely dependent on the Israeli authorities for water. Um, and there's also a lot of problem with... Um, approving new wells, drilling new wells in Palestinian territories. So that would be in the West Bank area. And then the last one would be the aquifer, uh, the coastal aquifer, which is the one which uh, Jacqueline mentioned that is undrinkable uh, completely about. Um, so these don't involve Jordan or Syria or Lebanon? There are surface water, which are shared between Syria and Jordan. Uh, that's the Armuk River, right? It's shared. Yeah. But not, not a big aquifer. Mm, there is no doubt. No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, given that the work you do is like transboundary waters, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, like the ease with which, or the difficulty with which you can cross borders in order to do your work, or if you have to do it remotely because of difficulty, and like how that's kind of reconciled um, in the work. Um, just, I was wondering if you could talk about, talk about since a lot of the work you do is with transboundary water issues, um, how difficult or easy it is to cross those borders in order to do your work, um, and if it is easy, how you kind of reconcile that, if it is difficult, how you manage that, and do you have to work remotely a lot because of that? Um, it's not easy, <laughs> to, as a short answer. Uh, we would have, I was a part of a project with the Greywater System Project that we were like, all right, we're going to build these systems, but 
we also want to make sure that there's a lot of cross-border cooperation. Um, and so we held 12 or 13, over three or four years, we held a number, uh, I think about a dozen conferences, making sure to bring together um, specifically Israeli and Palestinian uh, water experts. We also brought in members of um, respective communities that we were working in, as well as some people in local and higher government. And it's not easy to get uh, permits, especially for the Palestinians to come into Israel. Um, we also wanted to make sure we're like, all right, we're going to talk about these water issues, but we also want to make see, you know, when we're having these discussions and when or when they're having these discussions, is their perception of the other, so the Israeli wastewater engineer's perception of the Palestinian wastewater engineer's perception going to be changed at all because of these conferences and talking about it, um, talking about these issues. Now, obviously it was kind of a self-selective group, so given that they, they were willing to go to these conferences and these workshops and these um, field visits, you know, that they were already um, willing to have these conversations, but definitely just that face-to-face -face talk, all right, we're going to talk about these issues because they're, you know, we're both going to um, feel the effects of it. It, it was definitely beneficial and, um, you know, the science is great, but making sure that there's a lot of face-to-face -face talk is, is one of the main goals. And, yeah, it's not easy. It was definitely difficult just to have people cross those borders. So, yeah, so I like what the question is getting at. Um, I think that, so a couple of things. First of all, from the overall research perspective, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and one of the advantages that a place like the Arava Institute has to that extent is that we've been around for 20 years and we know a lot of people. Um, and I don't mean like government connections that help us get permits or anything like that. I mean, we have alumni all over the region. And so in a region where a lot of the diplomacy and the stagnated political process will like, I don't think there are a whole lot of people in the region who think that testing water quality on opposite sides of the border is controversial or is something we shouldn't do, but because in a lot of cases people just don't talk to each other, it can be difficult to get those measurements on one side of the green line and the other side of the green line. Um, but when it comes to like our Center for Transboundary Water Management, we've had interns and we have alumni from the West Bank, from Jordan, from Gaza from Israel, from all over the region. And so we can really just like call people up and say, hey, can you test it with you? Hey, can you test it where you are? Um, and so I think that that is helpful. Um, Jacqueline was talking about our track two conference, um, which we did for the, uh, Jacqueline was talking about a different conference. We are now running our annual track two um, environmental cooperation conference with the concept being um, that um, the track two diplomacy is like one level removed from the political process. So people who don't have to worry about politics or you know how things will look, we're talking academics, we're talking former officials and, and people like that, experts in the field. Um, once a year we bring people together at Kibbutz Keturah um, where the Arava Institute is based. This year we had, it just happened in September, we had about 70 experts on environmental issues um, from Israel, Jordan, the West Bank and Gaza. Um, who came to the Arava Institute to hold roundtable discussions and panel discussions on environmental issues that are affecting the region. Um, and yeah, it's hard. Um, I know that what Eve was just alluding to is that the, and Shadi, correct me if I'm getting details wrong, but the Israeli embassy in Amman, um, there was a, an incident, an act of violence at the embassy over the summer and the embassy remains closed. Um, and so in terms of you know, getting visas for Jordanians to come over to Israel, that's tough. Um, it certainly has been tough for years to get permits or visas for people from Gaza to come into Israel and also from the West Bank to come into Israel. Um, and we have, a, I mean, we have a pretty good administrative staff over at the Institute that works with each of our incoming students, each of our incoming researchers to make sure that they can have access to the field that they need to do their science, to do their research. Yeah. Uh, I know that, uh, Grab the mic behind you. Uh, I, I believe that it was in January that um, the Joint Water Committee finally met again after six or seven years of them 
you know, disappearing from the map. Um, is that influencing what the Arvantes does, you know, on certain projects or, I mean, you were just talking about, I mean, is that going to help this promise or this agreement to come together on certain of these issues, wells or something like that? Anybody have, yeah, water? Um, yes, as you mentioned, the JWC was founded during the Oslo Agreement. It was working until the early 2000s. Um, yeah, the diplomacy wasn't so great, so they stopped working together, and very recently they started working again. Um, I think the people that are working there are definitely more of a professional flavor um, in the water issues. Um, and I think one of the reasons that they were having trouble was due to the political uh, level that wasn't allowing a lot of their work to be done, um, which is something that Arava Institute is working with closely. And um, um, you want to add something about that? I would just say, you know, every attempt at cooperation is a good attempt. And I think that every attempt at working together is something that we support. It's great. <laughs> uh, thanks. So um, I'm a professor here at Tufts, and I um, work in a program called the Water Systems and Science and Society Program. And I've taken, over the years, uh, about 30 students over to work in, mostly in West Bank. Um, and we've actually been to the Ida refugee camp that you spoke about, where you saw the, 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 the child who had been hit by a rubber bullet. And we work on water projects there, and we're trying to get a handle on the water quality and water quantity problems that we're seeing in Ida camp and, uh, and other refugee camps that are, that are locally um, based. And so, um, and arguably, my perspective is very one-sided. I see mostly from the um, Palestinian side. So I just want to say that it's really, um, uh, you know, it gives me some hope for the future to see, you know, an Israeli and a, and a Jordanian Palestinian up together, um, you know, talking here in front of Americans. So it's, it may, may just applaud you for that. So that gives me some hope because we don't talk to any Israelis when we're over there. There's very little dialogue between the water communities in Palestine and the water communities in, in Israel. Maybe I need to spend more time um, hanging out with you guys. So the question really is, is you know, what hope do you guys have for the future? You're young, in your 20s or somewhere in there. Um, and you're, if you're going to be water professionals for the rest of your days, what, what do you see as the major challenges to making your work um, you know, possible? Um, obviously, water is, is political there. Every drop of water is, is political. How are you going to, you know, get to a point where you can actually have meaningful impact uh, across the region? Okay, um, for us, that's um, that's my perspective about the environmental conflict. As long as there's environmental conflict, there we can't solve another conflict because um, there, wa there there was like document documented um, uh, armed actions. Uh, for the water. Uh, one was between Syria, Jordan, Israel back in 1951. Over the, there was a shared aquifer, so it was about to run out of water. So, it's, uh, so there was like an armed action toward it. It's, it wasn't that big, but as uh, Kofi Annan said that uh, if, if, we can, if we don't pay, it, pay enough attention for the water at least, that uh, it's going to be le lead for war and conflict in the future. So our hope now is to fi to, to fix these conflicts about about the water and the climate or the env environmental issues in general, and then we're going to work on our conflict, the um, the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. But we in the Arab Institute we use this gate like the environmental issues because it's because we share the same region. Like this. we can say that uh, if we have an air pollution in Amman, that is going to reach Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or the West Bank in one hour. So, yeah. To add on that, really cool um, diplomacy options that we were talking about in the Institute is watershed diplomacy. And that is something that is applied, as I mentioned before, in the Beersheba Basin with the uh, Southwest Bank. Gaza and uh, the Beersheba and the Bedouin communities, which is something that tries again to like overpass um, a lot of difficulties and um, through a more regional specific uh, issue, 
um, address these water problems. Um, I agree with you. It's, it's you ask a really big question. Like I wish I, I wish I could solve the water problems of the Middle East and the conflicts of the Middle East. Uh, maybe one one day we will. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you for having us. Um, is there anything, Sarah, do you want to add anything at the end? Or? Yeah, we'll hang around, but thank you for having us. Yeah, we'll stick around.